engineers, researchers, and interns on large-scale projects with numerous U.S. government agencies, uh, notably the Department of Defense and Homeland Security. Um, more specifically, he directs CERT cybersecurity education training and exercise programs um, and research efforts. He also leads CERT's efforts in executing DHS's President's Cup cybersecurity competition competition and numerous DOD joint and combined cyber exercise programs. And he does so much more, but I want to go ahead and get to the presentation, so I'll, I'll limit it to that. Uh, Mr. Matt Carr uh, works, at the team, uh, works as a team lead, DOD cyber exercise development in the CERT division, a part of the CEI at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, he has more than 15 years of experience working in information security since joining the SEI in 2010. Matt has supported the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and now leads a team that builds cutting-edge practices towards solving complex information security problems. Uh, he's also an adjunct professor at Carnegie Mellon, um, so he uh, has the knowledge but also departs the knowledge to many different people. Um, so without uh, further ado, welcome Matt and Chris. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. <clears throat> Just want to make sure you can hear me. Sound OK? Well, aloha, everyone. This is like the best deal ever. We get to come from cold, rainy Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania out here and enjoy this amazing venue. And uh, to see all you here, we're, we're really grateful to be here. Um, so uh, today, we're going to get into some level of technical depth because we want to uh, expose you to some of the capabilities that other organizations in the government, the DOD and, and the Department of Homeland Security, have uh, sponsored us to create and then to make available to anybody via the open source software method. Uh, so that's what we're going to showcase today. This really is a showcase, more like a show and tell. If you do have questions, f feel free to just you know, call them out if, you, if, you, if you'd like. Uh, but we are, we are going to have. I think eight demonstrations, video-based demonstrations of the technology, so you get a, a, like a quick feel for everything. And then at the end, if some of you want to be so bold um, and you have a laptop, you could uh, try out uh, some of this technology and take on a couple of the President's Cup cybersecurity competition challenges if you wanted to do that. That's optional, of course. <clears throat> Okay, so here's the agenda. Uh, we'll, we'll get through a little bit about who we are and what we do at Carnegie Mellon Software Engineering Institute. And then we'll get right to the meat of what I was just talking about. We're gonna introduce you and showcase these technologies that have been, uh, again, sponsored by the, by the government and uh, have been made available as open source, which is great so that everybody can take advantage of them. And as I mentioned, if you want to challenge yourself, you are more than welcome to. We will show you how to do that and participate at the end. We will also leave the exercise challenge environment up for the rest of the conference time period, in case you wanted to try it out you know, tonight or whenever. Uh, well, we already got through introductions well. So um, just uh, again, Chris May, I've been at uh, Carnegie Mellon's Software Engineering Institute since 2001. Uh, prior to that, I served as an Air Force communications officer uh, for about seven and a half years. And uh, what's great about working at a Department of Defense federally funded research and development center is I feel like I've been serving for the last 21 years because 99% of all my work has been with the Department of Defense. So I get to go on base and uh, interact with operators uh, constantly, and it's been a real joy uh, to be in that role. Uh, <clears throat> hello, Matt Carr. Uh, I've uh, been saying that I'm the guy in the chair for this uh, talk, if anybody watched Spider-Man. Um, I'm the Ned, which would make Chris Spider-Man, and I don't know if that's necessarily the right uh, metaphor. But uh, I am a uh, um, uh, team lead on Chris's team, and I also help support the President's Cup cybersecurity competition. And separately, I teach at the Information Networking Institute. I'm also an alum of the Georgia Institute of Technology. Really proud of that. So if anybody's from Georgia, uh, yeah, good, good there. But anyway, happy to be here, happy to help support and, uh, and answer any questions that you have. 
All right, well, uh, like I, the main purpose of us being here is for you to be able to take this uh, back with you to whatever uh, units or organizations you, you, where you work, and hopefully to be able to apply some of this or use some of this tech um, to uh, benefit you know, cyber training and operations uh, because they're all free. So a little bit about who we are. Personally, you know who we are, Matt and I, but uh, the Software Engineering Institute is, a, is an amazingly cool place to work. It was uh, started as a Department of Defense uh, federally funded research and development center in 1984, and it is the only uh, DOD FFRDC that's focused on software engineering, cybersecurity, and now artificial intelligence. So those three areas are um, kind of our, our bailiwick for what we do. And uh, we also have the opportunity that's sort of unique among the DOD FFRDCs in that we're, uh, we can work for the Department of Defense, we work for other government agencies, but we can also work with industry as well, which is uh, pretty uncommon in this space so that we are able to kind of make sure that we uh, stay current with our industry partners and bring all of that knowledge and skills across to the government through our use. Uh, Carnegie Mellon, I'm not sure if some of you, any graduates of Carnegie Mellon here? Are we out in Hawaii? No? Okay. Uh, Carnegie Mellon is, uh, is a, you know, international research university. It's got campuses in Qatar and Australia and other, and right in California, Silicon Valley. But the main hub is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, over the years, we've been ranked, obviously, top in computer science for a while and uh, also in artificial intelligence, so a lot of research faculty. And what's cool about the SEI is, you know, we basically are all Carnegie Mellon employees, uh, and we can then tap into all of these research faculty members to bring their expertise back to the, to the Department of Defense and other government organizations via that conduit of that uh, FFRDC uh, contract that we have. So within the Software Engineering Institute, there's three big divisions. Uh, the first is the, you know, the software, what we do fundamentally is software engineering and architecture. Uh, and then there's an, a brand new one that just got stood up called our Artificial Intelligence Engineering Division. But uh, we work in the CERT division. Has anybody ever heard of the CERT Coordination Center or CERT, well, a couple hands raised up? So way back when, when I was a communications officer serving in a comm squadron in, in, uh, in Germany in the, uh, the mid-90s, uh, you know, we got an email that came out and it's like, hey, there's this, this vulnerability and, and you know, basically telling us what we had to do on our IT systems. Back then we were running Microsoft. Uh, Windows NT, we even had Novell back in those days, and so we were impacted, and, and there wasn't really at that time, certainly back in when CERT was founded in 1988, uh, any kind of like global center of excellence for cybersecurity, and that's why we kind of call that the birthplace of cybersecurity, because the government, when the, when the Morris Worm happened in October or November of, uh, of 1988, um, it spooked a lot of people in the DOD and because there wasn't any place to go for help or for people that had that level of expertise. And so they looked here and there at various uh, organizations and they tapped the SEI to form the Computer Emergency Response Team, which is the, uh, the acronym behind that. I don't know if we're actually still an acronym or not yet, uh, but we're... Or, we're, we're still a pretty big organization, the biggest division within the SEI. And within uh, CERT, there are six directorates that focus on all kinds of different things in cybersecurity. Uh, we have a threats and vulnerability analysis group that does, like you would think, a lot of deep dive malware analysis and vulnerability coordination. There, I mean, so there's a whole bunch of different things. Our directorate focuses on cybersecurity workforce development. We've been doing this for pretty much the entire time that I've been here, for 21 years. Um, and over that time, as an FFRDC, one of the key things that we have to do by contract is we have to stay in the gap areas where industry isn't. 
So we are always focused on tech or, or problems that they're not ready-baked solutions provided by industry. Um, and so a lot of the things you're going to see today that we've produced on behalf of the DOD and, and DHS are specific to those problems where the government might have, hey, we're running this big exercise and it's in a top secret classified range, and, but we need these specific capabilities to be in that range, otherwise it's gonna be not, it's totally unrealistic. So that's why we have to bring in a financial simulator or a SCADA simulator or whatever to make that kind of come to life inside of these, these uh, classified or closed loop networks. And so we're gonna showcase some of that stuff today we do, uh, we, we focus on platforms, uh, so being able to kind of uh, set the example for big acquisition programs, the one I'm thinking of and some of you I'm sure are aware of, the Persistent Cyber Training Environment Program that the Army is uh, responsible for. You know, prior to that coming online, there wasn't really, um, there wasn't a lot of capabilities that met the demands for these large scale big combined and joint cyber exercises. So uh, around 2006 or seven, we started to look into how can we make it really, really convenient for uh, cyber operators to just using their browser and only their browser, knowing that they didn't have the ability to install anything onto their computers, um, how can we make it available for them to just go out, click a link, and poof, you're given a, a virtual environment inside your browser where you can practice and train in realistic conditions. So we started that, in, like I said, in the, in the 2000s. And then around 2009 or 10, we started to see a need and a gap for doing collective training, large-scale exercises. There was, there was not very much available that was convenient. Everything was like you would have this hardware and then every single time you wanted to run an exercise, you had to completely rebuild the hardware towards their specifications. And it took months and months and months for, for the DOD to pull these things off. And so we were asked by US Cyber Command J7 to help them with uh, their, the very first cyber flag exercise, which happened in, in October, November of 2011. And, uh, and so by doing that, we had already produced some technology, the exercise network technology, which was, again, kind of that convenient browser-based way to do collective training with lots of teams that scale to 5,000, 10,000 virtual machines, but all nicely contained within your web browser. So that was, uh, that was our earliest um, kind of prototype for how to do this and solve those kinds of problems. And so we continued to iterate over time uh, in building capabilities. XNet turned to a system called STEP, the Simulation Training Exercise Platform, which kind of merged a few things. It merged individual training and collective training and exercise and then also simulation and test environments. So we had have DOD customers that might want to say, hey, we're looking to, to give a roll out this new uh, cybersecurity suite or these new, whatever this tool set is, and we want to be able to, we don't want to put it right onto our production networks and we don't really have a place to test it. So we allowed people to come in, basically modeled their networks in virtual, in virtual topologies back in, and this is a while ago, right? This is in 2010, 12, 13, um, where we were trying to solve those problems, allowing uh, those organizations to say, hey, let's get in there and really test this stuff well. Let's run simulated environments against real malware. And so it was used beyond just training and beyond just exercise. It was used for simulation and other things. Um, the one thing we learned with STEP, though, is we, and I'm going to show you in the next couple of slides, um, we, we learned that uh, manual labor sucks. <laughs> and so uh, in doing some of these early platforms, the way it worked was we would build you know, a platform and then you would have during an event, for example, cyber flag, the first three or four cyber flags that we ran for the government, um, for the DOD, uh, they would, during the exercise, like during the vulnerability period, we'd have requests coming in for this feature or this new capability. And all of a sudden, after years of being able to, uh, uh, basically attaching on features to this, to this you know, platform that was initially a prototype, you're left with a yarn ball of code. 
And, and so that made a lot, it made it very challenging for us to, you know, manage this kind of monolithic environment in this platform. And so the very first uh, prototype that, uh, and, and the platform that I'm going to start off showcasing to you today is called Crucible. And this is what we actually helped the Army um, design the PCTE environment. So back when they were, when the first funding came in for PCTE, Army Cyber Command was the executive agent for cyber training ranges for the DOD, and they said, hey, we, you know, we need to do this right. We need to think about how to build this thing that's scalable, that's modular, you know, that is not going to become this yarn ball. And so we did some research based on a lot of the experience we had. We, you know, interacted with lots and lots of organizations, and we said, here's what we think you should do. We wrote white papers and specification and modular, modular type of designs, and that went down to uh, the Army in Orlando, and a few years later, you, you have the persistent cyber training environment, right? And the PCTE uh, is a great capability, really cool. It's, it's making huge strides. The issue with it is, is there's a lot of people that want to use it that, aren't, that can't use it yet. It's still really designed for the cyber mission force. So this kind of those 133 teams, cyber protection teams and, and other teams that are kind of, they, they get first dibs on the PCTE now. And, um, and so there's a gap for other organizations that, that need to be able to do this kind of stuff. And that's where we are right now with this first technology that I'm gonna talk about. In addition to platforms, we also have run major programs. So the Marine Corps Cyber Reading, Operations Readiness Curriculum is uh, another gap area problem. So the, the Marines, uh, Marine uh, Forces Cyberspace Command, uh, MARFORCE Cyber, uh, was sending people uh, to the NSA's uh, Riot Pipeline, Remote Interactive Operator Training Pipeline. These are the really, really, you know, the hotshot offensive people that work at Fort Meade and other places. And, uh, and there was a, a very, very high washout rate in that very, very challenging training program. And so they asked us, the Marines asked us, hey, we need you to analyze the problem. Why are our folks washing out with such, you know, you know, regularity? And then what can you do to provide the gaps in training that will allow them to actually make it through the pipeline? And so that's what we did. We spent a couple of years we analyzed it and we created an operations pipeline <clears throat> uh, curriculum that then has turned like a, you know, sometimes 10 or 12% pass rate into the 80s now. So those are the kind of cool, challenging problems we get to work on at the SCI. And that's why I really enjoy uh, still working here. Uh, we'll showcase Topo Mojo, Foundry. We actually are going to give you a demonstration of the Foundry appliance. And let's get kicked into, uh, yeah. yeah, I should start off with this too. <clears throat> Let me start off with kind of the, the how we do this and the, con the concept or our approach to, to doing cybersecurity training. It's, we try to keep this very simple because there's so many models out there for cyber operations training and the like. Um, you kind of have to be able to say what's really the fundamentals. The first being is that you have to provide some kind of context, some kind of knowledge building. That's where classroom training really works well. It's because you, when you, you know, go to a SANS course or something, the training is awesome. It's fantastic training. But then it's that moment in time training. You're in that class, and then six months later, what percentage of what you learn are, do you actually retain in six months or a year later, right? And so we recognize that, hey, knowledge and skill building is something that is a constant thing. Um, for example, I worked in two uh, Air Force fighter squadrons, the 35th at Kunsan in Korea and the 81st in Spangdalem in Germany. And the pilots, you know, if they weren't fighting uh, or, or in operations, their mission every single day was training. That's how you really good teams and really good operators get and, and stay really, really good. They have to be able to train against the latest kind of missions now, under different conditions, exposed to different kinds of threats, and they have to do that regularly. It can't be a once a year go to a SANS class. Fantastic training, no doubt, but tough to keep your, you know, that, that uh, sword edge really sharp. 
So you start with knowledge building, and what, what works well for knowledge building is asynchronous online training for knowledge building. Not necessarily for, you know, maybe you can get to 70% mastery if you're really, really good by, you know, by doing knowledge building. There's a lot of capabilities out there. But then you need skill building, and you need to be able to do it regularly, all the time, and conveniently. You need to be able to just say, I'm going to log in, I'm going to check out this video on how to work with maybe the Elastic Stack uh, or, or Splunk or some new security tool, and then you want to click a button and poof, you're in an environment where you get to actually uh, implement the knowledge that you just learned asynchronously in a live, conveniently available lab or exercise environment. That's, and that's how kind of like a pilot goes out to train. This is how a cyber person has to be able to do it, that easily. And because they're so busy all the time, particularly the cyber mission force teams, uh, you know, for example, Army Regional Cyber Centers, they're busy constantly. So you have to provide it to them in little nuggets so that way they can get in, get the training they need within a couple, three hours or less, and, and then move on with their normal daily operations. So it's got to be convenient to be able to do that. And that's what we focus on. Knowledge building, skill building, usually provided asynchronously and on demand. And then you have to have the key element, the hardest part, the hardest element of taking a, a good team and getting them up to what you would call like top gun for cyber, right? Getting to the, the elite teams um, and elite operators is where you need to have continuous experience building. That's where you're in realistic conditions, battlefield cyber conditions, exposed to the latest threats, adversaries' behaviors, and you have to think on your feet. You have to work with your team to, uh, to get through these specific and very challenging problems as you work through this. That's how you keep that edge really, really sharp in cyber. And so these are the gap areas that we've been working on. And how do you know if, you're, if it's making any difference, if you're getting better or not? That's where this evaluation is central, right? You have to be able to assess to your standard, like let's in brief, let's do our mission, now let's do our AAR, and let's document where our gaps were and feed that back into our training cycle. So that's kind of what those arrows are, is that this is a continuous cycle, just like fighter pilots or infantry folks, that's how they stay really good. It's a continuous thing. Okay, so, so there's a, a lot of mixed opinions on open source software, right? Uh, a lot of people think it's, it's uh, kind of a, a drag, particularly people in the acquisition community. Um, they're changing, uh, but there are a lot of programs uh, that are sometimes open source software is seen as sort of like risky, or it's not going to be there when you need it to be, or updated, or whatever. And I get it. That makes a lot of sense. But there's also a, an enormous environment of developers that are dedicated to some of these platforms that are providing so much more support and, and the, the speed at which they provide features and testing when you're talking about thousands and thousands of global people contributing to some of these projects, it's too good to be true in some cases because it's free and available and you could test it. So there's good and bad open source software. Uh, we like it a lot because, and I'll show you how we integrate a lot of our capabilities with other big open source projects that make this widely available. The other thing with open source that's really that's really nice, as it says here on the slide, um, is that you know a lot of these tools. I'm thinking like cyber ranges. Um, they they tend in some cases not to necessarily be interoperable with each other. There, there's attempts, big attempts to try to make that possible. But by using you know kind of being very uh, you know forcing adoption of open standards, it really really helps with that interoperability. And I'll talk to you a little about that as, I, as we go through some of the showcase here. Uh, the other thing is, is you want to have extensibility inside of your cyber operations training environment. That means you want to say, hey, um, my, my hardware, I've been running this on-premise hardware for the last X number of years. This is getting expensive. And guess what? My boss in the DOD is telling me, you're going to go cloud. You're going to go cloud. And then you're faced with, well, God, we have this giant investment. How am I going to be able to make this work in other environments easily? And that's where you come, that's, that's what I'm going to show you, some of the lessons learned that we've 
learned the hard way by, by adopting some of these open standards that allow us to say, okay, we built this exercise for VMware, but guess what? We're gonna be able to shoot this up into the Azure cloud or up into the AWS cloud as needed because of how you, get it, uh, how you build it in the beginning. So that's uh, some of the other options. And the last, the last bullet on the slide, you know, um, the, the fact is, is that when you, uh, you know, when you select a specific vendor, whether it's a software tool, a platform, what have you, um, you know, it comes with a, a number of years of, of relying on it. You know, and so you hope that you choose really well, but you are kind of dependent on whatever vendors that you've selected to continue to be able to provide the capabilities that you want um, and, and, and hopefully be able to have some extensibility in there too. Maybe that feature set isn't available and I really need this, what can we do about that? So one of the things that we've really learned, and you'll see in a lot of Cyber Mission Force teams, cyber protection teams, if you look at their tools, the CPT tool sets, Almost all of it is open source software. I mean, it really is. There's a lot of open source that's being used by these teams to do their missions because the vendor lock-in is sometimes a problem. Not always, but sometimes. Okay, any questions uh, before we get into the actual software itself? Anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> I would agree with that. And we've seen that over and over. Solar winds. Um, you know, you have all of these vendors are not going to write open SSL on their own. They're going to adopt these, these open source products and just build them into their own software. Of course they are. Everybody has done that and will continue to do that. So you're going to have supply chain, software supply chain vulnerabilities. And I'll tell you what, you know, the folks that did uh, the actual bug in Apache that, that caused the, uh, the solar winds problem, they, you know, the, the folks at, at Berkeley that that are responsible for they they patch that in like seven hours, you know. I mean, these are these are sometimes. I wish sometimes Apple would be that fast. <laughs> now, granted, I'm a huge Apple fan, have been forever. But you know, what I'm saying is that you get you get people out there with these big big open source projects, and you'll oftentimes see that there is a huge uh, community that will drive into a problem and will get that thing resolved very very quickly. So there's good in that, and that you can't really get away from open source software anymore, no matter what you do. You're gonna see it embedded in vendor, in vendor provided commercial software. Got a question for the right. Mike. Did you wanna mention the, how it can ease releasability and export issues when you're working with Aviation for enhancing their capabilities? Absolutely, and I'm gonna hold that for our first use case slide that's coming up in just a couple of minutes, because that's, uh, that's a good prompt, thank you, sir. Okay, so Crucible is our uh, modular, uh, API-driven, which means we try to make this thing plug in where you have, you know, sort of micro applications that can plug into each other via APIs, which allows you to, if you have one little problem in one area, you can fix that or add that feature to this, this part of the back end via the API or to the front end UI, and you only have to do it that one time. You avoid that big trying to find in that 50,000 lines of code that one thing that you need to find and fix or provide capabilities to. It's so much easier and so much faster to do it in a modular API driven way. And so that's what we, that's what was in this white paper that we described to Army Cyber Command for how we think the, the PCTE should be, should be done all those years ago. And so we kind of ate our own dog food. And as you'll see, uh, these were the design goals for Crucible. Crucible is basically an open source cyber range and simulation environment that we've created sponsored primarily by US Cybercom J7. And we built this to replace STEP because we ran CyberFlag for US Cybercom from 2011 until about 2019 when the PCTE arrived. 
And, they, and then we kind of helped them get started on PCT, and now cyber flags run on the persistent cyber training environment. But they needed this bridge and this gap to be able to do that. So that's what we basically uh, provided and built for US Cybercom J7. One of the key things we learned over and over is building from scratch, like I said, is, is a drag. And it, you would see it constantly. People get comfortable with what they know. They're gonna say, okay, I know how to build a domain controller, and so I'm gonna do that from scratch, and then I'm gonna clone that out, and I have to go back in and redo all the domain settings, and it becomes sort of like this endless manual labor effort that takes tons and tons of time. We suffered with that for years, right? <clears throat> back in the day when we were first getting started, and we said, no more. We're gonna do this, and we're gonna do it infrastructure as code which means everything, the underlying platform infrastructure you can manipulate and it's saved in version control, Git, GitHub or GitLab environments, and it's always gonna be right. Every time you deploy it, it's deploying that pristine, clean version of it, right? And Terraform is an open source project by HashiCorp that is used all over the, the world. My brother-in-law makes ridiculous amounts of money working for a hedge fund. He lives in Australia and France, and they use Terraform to control everything globally across multiple cloud environments. Their entire infrastructure, all of their software, everything is stored as infrastructure as code. It allows them, when they need to make a change or a fix, they go in and they simply change the code and redeploy that particular piece instead of having to manipulate everything on the, on the platform itself. It's genius, and it's free, and it's really, really great capability that lots and lots of cloud providers are working with. And what's great about Terraform is it has tons of um, capabilities that they call providers. Providers are, how do we get this, this uh, environment that I created for VMware to play on Azure, or to play in Google Cloud, or on AWS, or whatever? Right, KVM, if you want to use open source Linux hypervisors, what have you. And they, they have these providers that do that translation for you so you don't have to do it manually every time you want to change something. It's genius. And so rather than us writing it you know, by ourselves, we said let's adopt Terraform since it's such an, an impressive open source great project. And so, yeah, infrastructure of code is really key because we don't want to have to keep creating content over and over. We want to be able to say, hey, this past exercise worked great. Let's tweak the code to update the mission scenario and then deploy that out to this particular provider, whatever we have, and it makes it easy. And I'm going to show you in the first use case that Mike uh, mentioned where we did uh, the Cyber Endeavor exercise uh, for Indo-PACOM this past November allowed us to get this exercise environment up and running in a, in a matter of a few weeks or, or even a couple of, you know, two weeks basically, which would normally in the old days would have taken six months to get a big combined exercise environment up and running. And so that's really key. Content reuse. I mentioned modularity, APIs, really key. We don't have time. Um, Extensibility, all of this stuff were really key that I've sort of already mentioned before. But the main thing you want is you want to have a, a, a user experience that is slick um, and that allows you to manipulate it very easily at the individual team level, the user level, whatever their role is in this training. You want to be able to present just what they need to be able to accomplish their mission, just the applications that they want. Maybe you need a help desk for the white cell to be able to track and say, okay, uh, this particular team is having these issues, let's provide a help desk application in there. And boom, it's in there. And so by following open standards, particularly single sign-on, you don't know how powerful single sign-on, how necessary single sign-on really is until you start having lots and lots of applications where people and exercises say, hey, I want to bring in this particular platform, or I want to bring in this hardware uh, simulator, maybe for a power grid or something like that. And I can say, no problem, if you follow these open standards like OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect, right, these open identity standards, then we can bring you in, and it's a no-brainer to, to, to be able to have that extensibility using those key open standards for single sign-on across the entire platform. Really key. 
So I'll show you a little bit about that. Uh, you're going to see a quick demo, a two-minute video, um, so I'm not going to go into great detail on the individual components, <clears throat> but player is the user experience application. So this is, everything we write is typically done in C Sharp on the back end, and we like uh, Google's Angular front end uh, framework, JavaScript framework, because it's really, really clean and slick, and it provides uh, capabilities that, um, there's other frameworks that work great, but this one we really like a lot and we tend to use for most of our, uh, our front end environments. Uh, you're gonna see what this thing looks like in just a minute in the video. But it has to be convenient. You have to be able to access it right from your browser, and it has to be able to give you everything you need. Access to the range and just the pieces of the range that you need. Any kind of applications, your, your mission guides, your rules of engagement, anything that you may want are basically just URLs that you point to another application or another web server for providing that specific service that you need. And you'll see that in just a second. Um, and that interface needs to be, you know, really manipulable at a very granular level, and you'll see kind of how we do that. Caster is, is kind of takes uh, that infrastructure as code, which is really just code in Terraform, um, that you have to get kind of familiar with the format uh, of what this code looks like and how to uh, manipulate it. And this provides sort of your environment for dealing with Terraform code in a way that integrates version control right in there. So magically, when you make a change, it just magically updates the code and version control in, in GitLab. We use another open source project called GitLab right as part of this effort so that everything that you do and you, and you, you can always revert back to a known good if you, if you do something you don't like. Uh, and, and that's really key. Um, it provides you, and, and you'll see in the video, like I said, in just a minute, you'll see how uh, you can, uh, everything in Terraform is called a module. A module can be a virtual machine. It can be the networking for virtual machines. It could be a swath of 2,000 virtual machines. All of these are modules, and you can have modules embedded within other modules, which is really slick. And so what you want to be able to have for reuse is you want to be able to say, I want this module that I used for last week or last month, and I want to be able to take that and then incorporate that into this other kind of uh, topology build and be able to do it in no time flat. And so that's why we needed our own application that take you know, the HashiCorp sort of model, which is you know, you've got to be a coder effectively. Not, you don't have to be, but they expect you to have a lot of coding experience and be able to get in there and in a way dumb it down for normal people that work in, in GUI environments. And so that's what you'll see some of in, in, uh, in Castor. Steam fitter. So within any good experience building event, you need to have stimuli on the network. You need to have activities that go on all the time, right? And so, you'll see, and so if it's a static network that you're working in, these cyber defenders are working in, um, and, if, and if the, uh, you, you want to be able to basically write your mission, um, your master scenario event list, your measle for your exercise, that's kind of all the activity that's going to happen during this event, right, your, M, your measle. And then in there, you want to be able to say, for this particular team, they're doing great. And they're, they're kind of yawning at these injects that we're putting into the environment because they're so good. These are just not challenging them enough. So you want to be able to have, within Steamfitter, you can just bring on additional activity or you can manipulate huge parts of the environment all from, a, uh, from within this, this uh, application at the same time, which is really uh, very, very powerful. And you'll see kind of how that works in just a sec. So you need to be able to build your events, your, you know, and you can automate them, you can schedule them, uh, a lot of power in your hands. And again, we provide this, this kind of application, but the heavy lifting is done by another, uh, another tool called Stackstorm, which is similar to like a very powerful open source capability that allows you to orchestrate all kinds of different automations that you may have already built for yourself. And now Alloy, these are, so there's four primary pieces um, within Crucible. Alloy is how you take the topology that you built, the scenarios that you construct in Steamfitter, and your player configurations for giving the people just what they need and want inside of their user interface and then to be able to make that on demand 
where everything is automated. You can say, here's the uh, Cyber Endeavor exercise that we ran in November, and we just, now you can play that on demand, and everything runs just as it would, as you've pre-programmed them to do. And you still have the ability to get in there and manipulate that. Alloy allows you to take content that you construct and then be able to make it available for offline access. So anybody out there, any teams out there who may want to access this and play it again and practice again could literally click a button, boom, and there's your exercise. Maybe it's only a small lab environment, or maybe it's hundreds and hundreds of systems, all with scenario events going live in real-time automation. So that's kind of the idea behind this next generation of uh, you know, cyber range kind of capabilities. Quick update on the roadmap before I toss it over to Matt. Um, so we've been working on this for a while. Uh, it's still sponsored by uh, several organizations in the DOD asking us to continue to support things. So the, the government, when, uh, when it came out a couple of years ago that Microsoft had won the, the Jedi cloud contract, I remember, remember that happened, um, pretty much immediately they said, okay, well, we're going to be forced to go into the Microsoft Azure cloud pretty soon, so you need to be able to make it so that anything we construct inside of our on-premise environment, can, if we want to, we can say we need to push that out to the Microsoft cloud as, at, you know, when it's time to do that. And so that's already been constructed and built. Surprisingly, when you get very, very large exercise environments, you're getting into thousands of VLANs to isolate network traffic, virtual LANs, right? Um, and, and that can be quite complicated uh, to be able to do in an automated way, where you have to change this traffic for this particular um, you know, team or this uh, you know, non-player character user simulator environment. You need to be able to, be able to manage all those VLANs and do it not just in a, the old-fashioned manual way where you'd go into a switch or something and you'd actually configure it manually. Heck no. Now you need to be able to provide automation to do that. So that's coming very soon. Probably in the next two or three months that'll be ready. Uh, lots and lots of user activity, like what are people doing on the networks at, at what time? How, what is their performance like? We've been working on this using open standards, again, um, and uh, learning record stores. Uh, you know, the open learning standards that are out there to try to make sure that when you have a capability that you construct, you can, you can not only record the activity that was done, what a user potentially did inside of this environment, but then you can analyze it using, using a learning record store and, and learning analysis tools as well. So that's another piece in there that we've been working on. The caster easy mode, so caster still has code. You still have to do a little bit of code manipulation when you want to go in. It's pretty simple because it's pretty much all there and you can, you can access it, but you want to be able to have a, a, a really easy mode. And that's what we've been working on uh, and we continue to work on to make that topology construction even easier to work with inside of large environments. Uh, we are, we've just been asked by a new customer of ours, a U.S. Special Operations uh, Command, to um, they, they, don't, they don't want to use VMware anymore, which is shocking. The Department of Defense has always used VMware. My gosh, really? You want to go with an open source hypervisor? Yes, we do. So we're going to be doing, uh, you know, making all this stuff work on open source hypervisors. Um, yes, sir. Uh, please tell me that Debian KVM. Oh, we, 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 right now, we, our first task is to research the best option. <laughs> you don't know yet. Okay, we should talk. Yeah. We, we definitely have our opinions on that. Um, so uh, we, we've, been, we've run our own, uh, we developed our own uh, OpenID Connect and OAuth 2 identity server. We've been using that for several years to do, provide that uh, single sign-on capability for all these events. And, um, and so we're gonna go use Red Hat's uh, environment, their key, clack, key cloak uh, identity server. Uh, we're gonna adopt that and login.gov. Login.gov provides federated identity for the entire government and beyond. So where possible, get out of the business of doing IT when you can and let others do it for you if they can do it to your specs and requirements. So that's what we try to do as well. Chat, as you, most of you I'm sure know, chat is essential to any kind of team, like geek teams. Geek teams live on Slack. 
period, or on whatever chat environment you're working in. They just do. That's how they communicate. They'll do that before they do voice uh, without a doubt. And so chat is an essential application, period, dot, end of story. So Mattermost, open source. Now, you know, the folks at Mattermost decided, hey, we don't want to stay open source all that long. So we're going to look into other directions like Zulip and Rocket Chat, which are o other very high quality open source chat server environments that we're migrating capability towards. Um, before you see the video, this is the use case. Uh, so I mentioned Cyber Endeavor last year. We were approached in, I think, around the August timeframe for a November execution of Cyber Endeavor. Cyber Endeavor is a part of Pacific Endeavor, and it involves, uh, you know, basically cooperation and collaboration with allied nations in the Pacific Theater of Operations. Uh, upwards of 20 allied countries were involved in this event, and some of them, you know, they were basically brand new, <laughs> completely new, right? They, they have no cyber operations, no capability, whatever. Um, and others like Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea are some of the best in the world. So that's where you have to have the capability to provide training to people at where they are and give them just enough challenge so that they get real training value out of it um, at their level. So, you, so that's a key element for what we were able to provide for Cyber Endeavor, is to be able to say we're going to take these uh, previously developed capabilities that are we built for cyber protection teams in the DOD or for Army Regional Cyber Centers and repurpose that, you know, obviously just the, the open and distribution A, open, open source type of uh, content, uh, and make that available to, co to coalition partners. Uh, and do that within a span of a few weeks. So we got, probably got started in late August, and we're ready to execute in mid-October for, uh, for the Cyber Endeavor exercise. And we did that all because of what I've just described to you before, because we don't like to do things the old-fashioned manual way. Uh, it was a cloud-based effort because we certainly weren't going to have countries in the Western Pacific and Eastern Pacific uh, reaching back to some environment in the U.S. Uh, you know, the speed of light is the speed of light, and performance has to be great. So very quickly, we were able to stand up a, uh, a Singapore-based uh, AWS cloud environment and be able to provide all the capability from Singapore so everybody that was in the theater could reach in and get great snappy performance without having to, you know, suffer with the reach back problem that a lot of people have. That's what's great about cloud. Um, and we're also still able to keep some of the stuff for US teams that were participating over, because we had to isolate what the, some of that content was, we had to be able to provide that out of the continental US um, and keep that sort of separated in some ways. So, sir. Ooh. That's a, that's, a, that's a tough one. That's a good question. Um, I don't know if I can honestly provide a good answer to that one. Uh, the question was, uh, you know, how's the DOD uh, looking at a paradigm shift for automating the kill chain uh, or something to that, close to that? And um, I think that might be a little beyond my level of expertise, to be honest with you. I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to talk to you about that, though. Anyway, um, I just wanted to provide a quick glimpse into some of the capabilities that we have that are freely available to anybody out there because it's open source and to be able to speed up, you know, some kind of the cyber exercises or cyber simulation that you may want to do um, that, you know, is, is available uh, to your organizations. And let's take a quick peek. Crucible is an open source application framework for cybersecurity modeling, simulation, and training. It includes four main applications, Player, Caster, Steamfitter, and Alloy. Player is the main user-facing application. From here, participants in a training lab or exercise are given access to everything they need to achieve their objectives. Virtual machine consoles are directly accessible and can also be opened up in a new window or tab. 
Documentation such as network maps, rules of engagement, or credentials lists can be provided in the left-hand application bar. In addition, other supporting web applications can be included in the application bar, such as chat or a help desk. Caster uses the open source infrastructure as code tool Terraform to deploy virtual machines to be used in training. Caster allows content developers to define and version custom Terraform files and tightly control how resources are deployed and modified. Caster also supports the insertion of Terraform modules, which allow for quicker development time and support code reuse. Terraform supports multiple infrastructure providers, such as VMware, Microsoft Azure, and AWS. Steamfitter is an orchestration tool that allows content developers to create timelines of custom actions that will execute against a specified set of virtual machines. These tasks can be configured to execute for a specified length of time or number of iterations, or to execute based on the output of a parent task. Developers can allow certain tasks to be executed by the end user, and task results can be scored. This allows content developers to quickly create a complex scenario that can allow a Crucible lab to run autonomously. Finally, Alloy combines resources from Player, Caster, and Steamfitter to create an event in Crucible that will run on demand. Participants can choose when to launch the event, and it will run for a set amount of time. So as you can see, that, that one of the exercises of the Survey, Protect, Defend exercise, SPDX, that we ran for Cyber Endeavor, as soon as that we were, we were done actually running the exercise, it became an alloy on-demand deployable asset with a click of a button. So that's what's really key about that reuse piece. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Carr now. All right, hello. So, so what I was telling Chris while the video was playing is that we are now 50 minutes into our hour and a half talk, and uh, we're a little behind that on the, uh, on the slide front. But I will say, Chris and I taught for a number of years, and I'm, I've been in this position before, so I'm fully prepared to get us out of it. So uh, we're gonna talk about Topo Mojo. So if Crucible is a really complex way to uh, deliver very uh, elaborate networks, Topo Mojo kind of plays in the other side of the space. It really focuses on simplistic uh, creation of uh, simple lab environments and also allowing you to publish what you've created. So this is, uh, this is really important when it comes to knowledge transfer. So uh, Topo Mojo makes it easy to not only create virtual machine environments, and when I'm, when I'm talking about VM environments, I'm, uh, for Topo Mojo, I'm talking about in like the single to, dub to low double digit numbers of virtual machines. That's kind of its sweet spot. You can go higher than that, there's nothing stopping you, but, um, but that's kind of where it plays well. It's again, 100% browser based, it allows you to create content and then uh, with the click of a button, uh, publish that content and then allow a uh, unlimited number of um, uh, consumers of that content. So, content. What do you what do you mean when you say content? Well, uh, I'm talking about a set of virtual machines in a particular start state, coupled with a document written in Markdown that allows you to uh, to uh, consume. You know what's uh, what's there learning wise, and then also engage with the virtual machines to. Uh, to do that uh, that uh, skill building. So uh, what, what I really wanted to highlight here is that uh, second bullet where there are a, a lot of people that know a lot of things about cyber. Uh, what they lack is a way to clearly create content and publish it out there for others to consume. And that's the problem that Topo Mojo uh, attempts to solve. Um, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit later about how it's also enabling us to create content for large-scale cybersecurity competitions. So what are some of the features? Well, there's three main ones. One is a lab builder that allows you to take templated virtual machines. So these are starting points that are just as uh, embedded in the system or created by administrators. Um, deploy those to a specific workspace. I mean, this is just your, your area for constructing content and manipulating those, changing the start state, maybe adding new software, or uh, changing uh, the uh, login credentials, or uh, using a different operating system. All that's available to you as uh, in the Lab Builder interface. Um, once you're comfortable with what you've created, you hit a button to publish it, 
and that publishing then makes it available in a read-only state to anybody who wants to consume it. So uh, they're able to launch the lab. It deploys virtual machines on a hypervisor backend. You can go and in um, engage with those virtual machine consoles, read through the document, decide what you're supposed to do, and, uh, and, then, uh, and then work through that. So this is very uh, useful in that asynchronous training that Chris was talking about earlier. And then finally, the competition engine allows you to insert variability. So we can create um, uh, deploy states where you have a random um, answer that is generated, embedded into a virtual machine environment uh, to be found by a competitor. And, and therefore, all of the, uh, launch, the uh, challenges created inside of this platform are, uh, we call it infinity challenges, where uh, those are, it's never deployed the same way twice. Uh, and that can be really useful when we're trying to create content for a competition where we don't want people to share, uh, to share answers. Uh, we have uh, different kind of sub-features, if you will. You're able to collaborate uh, on uh, the creation of, uh, of that content. There's a uh, document editor that's kind of fully uh, you know, uh, synchronous, so when you, whenever you make changes, Google Docs style it re replicates those changes to other uh, browsers that are connected. You can upload uh, files as ISO images that get, it, get attached to the virtual machine. Uh, I mentioned the document editor. Uh, you can set limits on the resources that are used, so you can have it run for a specific period of time. You can, of course, uh, edit the amount of resources from a virtual CPU, RAM perspective, uh, disk perspective, et cetera. And then there's an administrative interface where you can see everything that's deployed, clean up resources after they're no longer in use, et cetera. And with that, let me uh, pull up a short demo here. <laughs> Mojo has two components, a lab player and a lab builder. The player interface allows one to browse and launch existing labs. Once launched, you can access the various hosts to accomplish the lab objectives as shown in the lab document. If you want to collaborate with others, invite them to your running lab by sharing a link with them. When finished, end the lab to free up those resources. The builder interface is for content creators, people with a lab idea that they'd like to share with others. Add machines by selecting from existing templates and give them an appropriate name and description. To put machines on the same network, just give them the same network name. After modifying the machine, save it to persist its new state. While preparing your machines, you can upload files that are accessible on the machine's CD-ROM drive. Create a lab document using Markdown script. The image manager allows you to insert graphics into your document. When everything is ready, publish your lab so others can discover it. All right. Questions on any of that? Yeah. Was there a question? Yeah. So, yeah, so on the back end, it's communicating with a um, VMware hypervisor. It uses VMware's Web MKS uh, JavaScript uh, app to enable that console connection. And, uh, and, then, and that's actually part of what will need to be developed as we move to other hypervisors, is determining where that, what that console access will look like. Uh, all right, so next, uh, oh, actually, uh, yeah, so I mentioned earlier that it, this is helping us enable large-scale cyber training, and uh, Chris mentioned uh, our support to um, uh, DHS CISA's President's Cup Cybersecurity Competition. So it's actually Topo Mojo on the back end that is where we're, where we're authoring all the challenges used for the last three years of the President's Cup uh, Cyber Competition, and, and then we create another uh, app, which I don't know that we have slides on it, but we but it is part of the uh, the final demo uh, environment uh, called Gameboard that takes the Topo Mojo based challenges and organizes them into a competition, complete with points and maps and et cetera. So, 
so yeah, this, uh, the President's Cup, I guess uh, going over some of the slide here, it was uh, uh, established by Executive Order 13870. Its uh, goal is to uh, find the best and brightest cyber practitioners in the federal government. It's only open to federal civilian employees and members of the, uh, of the military. And uh, we've had uh, over 1,000 participants each year um, including, um, uh, I guess, spread across both the individual tracks as well as the uh, team competition. We've also integrated Topo Mojo Base Labs into an immersive uh, cyber video game environment that uh, we, we've uh, done with some help from the uh, Entertainment Technology Center at uh, Carnegie Mellon. And those experiences have actually uh, made their way onto YouTube. So if you search on YouTube for President's Cup Cyber, you'll find the last three years worth of live stream competition. So this is done with CISA staff um, serving as co-hosts for uh, the broadcast. And we took everybody's screens that were participating in those in that last day of the team's competition, uh, put them all uh, you know, through our uh, awesome production uh, team that helps create uh, their uh, broadcast media team and ultimately uh, create awareness for the competition, which is one of the, uh, one of the parts of the executive order. Uh, and then finally, we're taking all the challenges that we create for that competition and releasing them as open source. We have the 2019 challenges up on GitHub right now. Those are on CISA's GitHub site, and we plan to release the 2020 and 2021 uh, challenges uh, in the coming months. So, uh, so kind of a good news story open source-wise there as well. All right, uh, switching gears to uh, some internet simulation tools. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about TopGen and Graybox. So these are, um, these are efforts that aim to miniaturize um, what we do for our large scale cyber training, uh, realistic internet representation, at least in so far as the, uh, you know, uh, the core internet protocols go, BGP, um, the web, email, DNS, et cetera. Um, and we're trying to create uh, uh, those environments f uh, inside of closed loop uh, air gapped uh, um, uh, networks. So we, we, have, we had that goal, but then we also wanted to create uh, them on a smaller scale so we could embed them in Topo Mojo Labs, for example. Uh, and so that's where top gen and Graybox come in. So we took the environment that we created for past large joint uh, training exercises uh, network-wise, uh, which is um, a bunch of routers, 70 plus routers spread across uh, multiple continents, all with the, the uh, uh, accurate latencies injected, uh, and uh, put them into Linux containers on a virtual machine. Uh, and it, that's the short story. Um, how does this split up? What's top gen and what's Graybox? Well, top gen is the, are these applications that are running inside of this network. So we have web servers, we have uh, uh, DNS resolvers, email, um, uh, email servers, uh, a Tor uh, onion routing in, uh, infrastructure for obfuscation, and then Bitcoin um, uh, for you know, cryptocurrency simulation. Um, so that's all the uh, applications that are running there, and then we took those and put them into um, into containers inside of Graybox so that we could have that available as a Topo Mojo template or inside Crucible, and you could use that as another uh, resource inside of a training, an exercise, a simulation, et cetera. Uh, with that, I'll show a quick demo of that. <laughs> TopGen offers multiple co-hosted virtual application layer services such as HTTP, DNS, and email. In other words, TopGen is the default route of last resort to the simulated internet's simulated applications. Any destination not otherwise available and known to the simulated internet backbone routers will eventually be forwarded here. TopGen will answer such traffic if it recognizes its destination IP address as one of the many web, DNS, or email servers whose addresses it has configured on its internal loopback. In such a case, the incoming request is forwarded to the appropriate application server process, Nginx for web, bind for DNS, and postfix and dovcot for email. As an example, the Nginx web server is configured to co-host thousands of pre-scraped websites front pages and serve the appropriate one that matches each client's request. From a client's perspective, TopGen hosts the front pages of the Internet's most popular 500 websites 
and the helpful landing page at topgen.info, which contains instructions and a list of available sites. Multiple different enclaves of an exercise can be connected to the gray box simulation in geographic locations relevant to the given scenario. Greybox will provide them with the ability to communicate with each other over what looks and feels like the real internet, and to also access services available on the simulated internet for an added dose of realism. Greybox is a realistic simulation of the internet backbone, implemented with the help of Linux containers on the core network simulator. Each blue dot on the map represents an ISP backbone router. Red links between ISP routers simulate transmission delays, matching the actual geographic distance over which light must travel across fiber optics from origin to destination. Each router runs the BGP protocol, supported by Quagga, the most popular open source routing package. Here we can observe one router's view of its neighbors. While all application layer services, such as websites, are served from the same container, TopGen, the path over which they appear to be reached differs from one site to another, as illustrated by running a trace route to different destinations from a simulated user container. While all application traffic is ultimately routed into TopGen, each router is responsible for a geographically relevant subset of the whole Internet's IP address space. So paths taken to reach individual websites reflect their real-world location. So, uh, that was Gabe Somlo, the developer of uh, TopGen and Graybox, and uh, one thing he, he forgot to mention is uh, the original version the original version for top gen was used in uh, in one of our DoD exercises and when it was first deployed onto the network it did include the actual 500 most popular websites uh, on uh, the internet which uh, Oops. yeah that was uh, that was a that was a mistake uh, we we quickly remedied that but um, but not before we had to let some people know uh, what, what had happened. So anyway, with that short story, I'll turn it over to Chris. <clears throat> okay, so now that we're on the simulator, we got through the platforms, Topo Mojo, Crucible, or the kind of the platforms that run everything. Now we're into the simulators that, we, that allow us to bring realism into, you know, kind of exercise environments or even little labs that you can run. If you need the internet inside of your little lab, you pop in the gray box VM and you have the entire internet in your two virtual machine lab if you want to do something like that in there. So that's, these are capabilities that um, have a lot of value depending on what scenario you want to use them in. Now ghosts, <clears throat> this is the realism factor uh, that you need when you don't have thousands of real world end users using your network, right? So just like in video games, they have these things called non-player characters. They're the computer players that, that do all the stuff when you're playing you know, whatever game you like, uh, they're the, the characters that are there stealing a sports car or, uh, or shooting at you or what have you. The same needs to be applied inside of cyber training to make it real, to have real users doing real things that from a Turing test perspective, it would be very, very challenging for you to be able to say, hmm, is that a real user, a real human being, or is that a computer? It's really hard to tell. And that's what our goal is in creating ghosts. Ghosts allows us to orchestrate those non-player characters inside of exercise environments so they have real personalities, real backgrounds, and do uh, consequently accurate types of activities depending on who they are and what they do. And so that's what we've been working on, and we'll talk to you a little bit about a use case we, we work with the Army to make this really um, essential for those elite teams that can spot the fake traffic generators or the lame user simulators. They can say, oh, that's crap. Let's just filter all that out, and then we can see really what you're hitting us with, which are the injects. We need to be able to cloud the environment just like it is in the real world. So that's what Ghost does. Um, and uh, I don't know if it, too many people know Raphael Mudge. Uh, he, uh, he's a uh, He's an old friend of ours, an old cyber flag uh, friend of ours. He's one of the top 
uh, cyber operator people in the world, a great, a great developer. He also owns and develops Cobalt Strike, which is a penetration testing tool that's used by lots of organizations and government uh, teams. Um, but the point is, is that you need to be able to uh, hit these very, very good teams with unique stuff that looks real, otherwise the training value goes down. Maybe not so much for just your run-of-the-mill people that are just kind of getting acquainted with your environment, but for these Army Regional Cyber Centers, where they are, we exercise every single month with them, where they are, we're hitting them with the latest and greatest things that they haven't even heard of before necessarily, that's where you have to have that level of realism so that they can really train as they fight, as they will fight. Uh, so Ghost orchestrates these MBCs, uh, non-player characters, and they become uh, very hard to distinguish from real people. So you might have, uh, you know, uh, on the blue team, you might have NPC administrators doing administrative activities, you know, whether you know, launching new services, manipulating a Mac and directory, what, what have you. You might have also dumb users that are clicking phishing links or that are doing the type of things that dumb users sometimes do that cause strange things to happen on your network. You could also have um, insider threats as well, uh, you know, which of course sometimes you have malicious insiders and sometimes you just have insiders that don't really know what they're doing and they are an insider threat in and of themselves. And you could also have NPCs that are actually providing you with answers. The, 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 the key thing about NPCs is that they need to be able to be responsive to the environment as it changes. And that's the really tricky thing to do, is to be able to say, this condition was just met. Now, as a result of that condition, the NPCs are going to act in these different ways. And we use a lot of machine learning uh, and, and, and artificial intelligence capabilities uh, to actually get, uh, get some of that done. Ghost has been around for uh, about three, four years now. Uh, the first two phases are done, where we actually get, uh, you know, the type of video game level uh, NPCs that might be sitting around drinking a beer in the bar or, or doing whatever you, know, whatever you might suspect in a game. But the thinking adversary is what we're working on now. This is where we're using machine learning to really caught, you know, be able to judge what the blue team is doing and then provide a learned behavior in the NPCs to be able to act on whatever they just did to provide increased and unique stimuli into the network. We just wrote, uh, I'll pull this up. I too. And I'll get that at the end. That, that basic, that link, I think you'll have a PDF of this as a result of coming to the conference. That link points to a brand new uh, technical report that we just wrote and a blog series that we did on how to use machine learning and AI to make these NPCs, to orchestrate them in a way that makes it really, really tough to tell if they're real or if they're not. Let me give you a quick demo. In an exercise or simulation, there are players, human cybersecurity operators. Other roles are controlled by a computer. These are non-player characters or NPCs. Ghost is that computer platform that orchestrates friendly, hostile, and every type of NPC in between that our players would encounter. The solution to orchestrating complex and realistic cybersecurity exercises with many computer-controlled roles is our Ghost platform. Ghosts create realistic network traffic, but is not traditional user sim. It is not simply a mechanism for traffic generation. It avoids creating generic packets on the wire that have no context or do not map back to specific user activity. Rather, Ghosts provides context-driven user activity on a network because it focuses on what every computer-controlled NPC on the network is doing, what decisions it might make, and uses the results of those decisions to make every future decision as well. In essence, Ghost brings harmless administrators and hostile red team operators to life within an exercise. Ghosts give them growing intelligence and mimics what people may do in real life. With simple configuration files, clients can be pre-programmed to perform a random series of tasks throughout an exercise, specific activity at a point in time, or infinite combinations in between. From the control server, you see and control all of your MPC activity in real time. 
with rich reporting dashboards and actionable intelligence. Blue team players want to show that they can defend their terrain and the users within, even when those users are unpredictable and subject to making wrong decisions that affect more than just themselves. What this means is Ghosts enables exercise creators to build enclaves of blue teams that perform specific tasks. The system also provides the ability to simulate active insider threat scenarios or simply random security mistakes that any user might be unfortunate enough to make, such as falling for a phishing attack or similar situations. On the other hand, red team players want to simulate large-scale attacks, coordinated efforts up and down the kill chain, and be able to adjust to defenses. Ghost provides OP4 players with these abilities via a scriptable interface that they can use to control a large-scale NPC team that performs distributed and or dependent tasks. As an example, denial of service attacks including hundreds of machines can be created and modified as defenders take steps to mitigate its impact. In a sense, Ghost is an on-demand bot army for red teams. In building and delivering effective cybersecurity exercises, we have found that the key ingredient to maximizing value is realism. Ghost is a solid framework for creating great scrimmages with all the necessary teammates and opponents so that teams can practice their way to becoming elite. All right, well not, uh, not everybody needs to be elite, but there are um, certain uh, teams that, that really do. And so I wanna uh, give you a quick use case for that. It's not, there we go. So for the last 10 years or so, um, the SEI has been working with the Army Network Enterprise Technology Command that, that runs all of the Army networks in addition to all five of the regional cyber centers that are globally distributed, including one here on Oahu. And every other month or so, we run events for them that sharpen that sword and test their um, mission essential tasks and, their, and allow them to practice their TTPs. Uh, these events are very highly realistic. That's where Ghost really um, has come of age because these teams are used to getting uh, to, to, they're really, really good since they've been doing this so long. We, we give them stuff all the time, and so we have to be very um, uh, smart in how we bring realism into the environment because they happen to be some of the best in the world. Um, the other thing that's, uh, so we do this three times a year in Mercury Challenge exercises. They're usually four to six hours because these people are busy. They can, we can uh, obviously schedule them whenever it works for them, whether that's three in the morning for somebody that might be in Kuwait or in Seoul or here in Oahu or in Fort Huachuca or in uh, Stuttgart, Germany. We run these things for them and, um, and they, we perform all roles. So we perform the, the red hat role, the black hat, the exercise controller, the intel analyst for them if they don't have intel on their teams handy. We provide a lot of uh, requests. They, they ask us for requests for information. We answer those as if we were higher headquarters. We provide that level of realism that you get when you only have those four to six hours and you don't have the ability to pre-coordinate and pre-configure all of this. You just want to be able to get your team in, get trained up, see how well you did, and get ready for the next event, which happens, every, like I said, about um, every other month. At the end of, of the year, we run a larger, longer exercise that's called the Elite Mer Mercury uh, exercise. Uh, all five uh, RCCs participate in this, and this is meant to be their annual assessment of their capabilities. This is where they, they're, they're not just training, but they're actually uh, competing to be named the RCC of the year, and they're also looking at how, um, how well they can perform their missions under various degraded conditions that they're not necessarily expecting will happen inside of their network environment. So that's kind of a use case for how Ghost really does allow us to manipulate this in very, very complicated ways and give them the type of training that they really need to maintain their edge. Any questions about ghosts or about user sim type of stuff? Okay. We're getting close on time, but I'm gonna speed up. Yeah, we have 10 minutes, that's fine. Um, so wireless emulation, this is another one of those gap areas. How do you do wireless training inside of a top secret 
skiff. It's not easy to bring in any kind of wired, wireless into there, right? You have to be able to do it in a virtual environment. So that's what WellED is. WellED is our customized wireless emulation link layer exchange daemon. And rather than me uh, taking too much time to explain this, I think I'll just cut right to the video to save time. Obviously, there are problems with using physical devices. They're good in reality, but then you're left with this situation where you have one device, whether that's a power grid that you're bringing in or some kind of substation or whatever it is, but then everybody has to timeshare on that one device and you have to do manipulative configuration to get it reset so other people can train. If you can virtualize physical, that's genius and, cap and makes it very possible for you to do lots of good things that takes those problems and make it look like that virtually. Everybody gets their own endless number of wireless clients or wireless access points that they can train in on their own in their own isolated environment. So that's the idea behind WellED. I'm gonna let uh, the expert, we also have uh, GPS emulation so that you can do real war driving inside of open street maps um, or any other environment. We have a simulated integrated bridging system that allows you to control SCADA, uh, systems on side of a, a ship, and also to be able to monitor its course and its GPS coordinates and, uh, and, and other kinds of capabilities. All kinds of different wireless scenarios can be practiced inside of here. And let me just kick straight to the demo so you can take a quick peek at that. Where'd that go? The wireless emulation link layer exchange daemon, WellED, allows for realistic training on wireless networks within a virtualized environment. Cybersecurity training relies heavily on virtualization. This works well for most training that involves a simulation of systems wired to the network, but for training that involves the use of wireless networks, there aren't many virtualization options available. Typically, this type of training reverts to the use of physical devices with an entire classroom of students attempting to attack a single access point, or even worse, required to obtain and configure the devices themselves. Additionally, some secure facilities may not allow wireless devices to be brought into their training spaces, meaning that the training must be outsourced to what is likely a more expensive vendor training course. With WellED, you can integrate virtual wireless networks into your existing cyber range. The simulation enabled by WellED will allow virtual machines in a virtual environment to have realistic wireless interfaces that can be used by all standard wireless tools. WellED leverages a hardware simulation driver present in the Linux kernel to relay wireless frames between virtual machines running in a VMware-based environment. This could be a user's laptop running VMware Workstation, or it could be an ESXi host in a large cyber range. The frames are transferred between the guests via a master daemon that runs on the host. This transfer of frames utilizes the VSOC address family to transmit the data between guests and the host. Configuration of the master daemon is simple. Just run it, or you can install it as a service on your host if desired. WellED comes with a systemd unit file that will load the driver with the desired number of interfaces. We typically patch the driver to allow for a little more customization than comes standard in an effort to make the training a little more realistic. The hardware simulation driver allows for the radios to be placed into monitor mode so that frames can be captured and analyzed. This allows for some of your favorite wireless attacks to be performed. All of the wireless frames you would expect to see are generated, management, control, and data. Because the wireless networks are completely virtual, there is no need to worry about interference with the real world. To simplify the setup of WellED, we have pre-configured OVAs for OpenWRT, Android x86, Fedora, and Kali available for download. Using WellED, your security team can generate and investigate wireless frames with ease. So again, that's one of the simulators that we built custom, uh, based on a custom request for uh, people to be able to train inside of closed loop networks. And what we're going to do, there's a couple of these that aren't that uh, kind of, I would say, you don't really need to know much about. 
V-tunnel, we're gonna, we don't have much time, so we're gonna skip this one, but basically the whole concept of this is to keep the management traffic for uh, an exercise, all of the command and control that might be happening between a ghost server and the ghost clients, or all of the logging stuff that you're doing to check on behavior, to keep that completely separate and isolated from the game space networks that the end users can manipulate, or perhaps monitor. So to be able to tunnel all that traffic, um, basically at will, and use automation to do that makes it really helpful and increases the fidelity of your training system. So we're gonna, we're gonna pass on vTunnel. Um, of course, all of these videos and all this content are available on the website, and we, the last slide that you get in a PDF has links to everything in there if you wanna investigate that a little bit further. SCADA SIM and FinSIM, these are things that, uh, that we've, we've done again. They're simulators. There's actually quite a few SCADA simulation capabilities out there. When we wrote SCADA SIM, uh, it was specific to particular types of SCADA environments, industrial control system environments, that they needed to be able to have manipula manipulability, if that's a word. Meaning, they might want to have, a, to, on the, in this scenario, on this day, a power generation scenario or they might want to have the next day a, a water treatment plant. And so this environment, SCADASIM, allows you to create uh, programmable logic controllers and human machine interface applications based on whatever kind of scenario and whatever kind of uh, in industrial control system you're trying to simulate. So it's kind of that one size meets many needs in one application. Uh, and the financial simulator is the last one on the list here. Before I cut it over to Matt for our very last demo, the, fi the FinSim is basically your banking transactions uh, simulator. So we have credit card merchants. We have merchants, credit card operators. We have banking platforms. If you want to be able to run through a financial scenario, you need to be able to have all that infrastructure that you can then interact with. And that's what FinSim provides. It's a drop-in environment. It can run on a single virtual machine and, and enriches your training scenario with these type of transactions. It also can work in, with, in partnership with Graybox to integrate cryptocurrency transactions via Bitcoin. And we're also working on Ethereum as, an, an, as a new plus into uh, to Graybox. But the last thing I want to do is let uh, Matt uh, take a look at the virtual appliance and then also um, give you guys the credentials for if you want to play a little bit later. So I think I've got three minutes left, so we'll see how this goes. Um, so uh, talking about the appliance, so we have a lot of uh, uh, software that we, we showed today, and one of the challenges that we have is how do we create um, demonstrations of this, and how do we allow others to interact with it? And so what we found is that just by publishing it on GitHub does not necessarily mean they will come. It, that is, it is challenging to run some of our software. He, uh, Chris mentioned, you know, .NET Core uh, backend APIs coupled with Angular um, uh, web apps, and it's, you know, to run all of these in containers, it can be challenging. So what we did was took uh, our production Kubernetes environment and downsized it to a single virtual machine running uh, a, on a distro called K3S and put it in an Ubuntu virtual machine that you can download the OVA for. So that's all on uh, GitHub. And actually, we deployed a copy of it to, for the conference. So, um, oop, hold on. Where's the, sorry. Well, I'll go back to the other slide. But we deployed a copy of it for the conference. Um, as far as uh, getting on conference Wi-Fi, we don't have that in this slide, but I'm sure everybody has figured out how to get on some kind of Wi-Fi here. You're all uh, cyber operators. So uh, get, on, uh, get on a network and then head on over to fcia.cmusei.dev and there's a copy of the appliance running there. It also uh, communicates with a uh, VMware cloud um, deployed uh, to uh, US West 1 in AWS, uh, where you can deploy two of our President's Cup challenges and just try them out. Uh, there's also solution guides for those challenges in case you find them challenging and you want to know how to solve them. Uh, and you can reset uh, to run through those challenges as many times as you want. So uh, that's all running. And then obviously, we're, uh, uh, Chris and I are happy to stick around after this for anybody who has questions or wants to go into the tech a little more in detail. But on that note, uh, how do you get in touch with us? Uh, there are our emails uh, at the bottom, and then a whole bunch of URLs. Ultimately, if you saw something you liked today, and you go to CMU SEI's GitHub, 
page, uh, which is you just CMU-SEI is our uh, is the uh, our account there. Uh, just search for the name and you will find it. But this is these are all the URLs too. If you take a picture and you want to and you want to find it later. And with that, oh wow, what a, what timing there? I think it was like <laughs> right. So with that, uh, that is our talk. Uh, I don't know if we have time for questions, but we're happy to take any if we have time. Oh boy. Scan your badge. Gotcha. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>